Great. Good morning and welcome to our event this morning with uh, Chris Cox and we're going to have a full panel discussion at 10 o'clock. This is on the future of online speech regulation. We are going to be talking about Section 230, but we're spent a lot of time talking about the First Amendment. For those who would like to ask questions during this uh, panel and the discussion, you are to use your digital device and put questions into Twitter at hashtag AskAEITech, so you're prepared for that. So my first guest this morning is Chris Cox, who is a member of the NetChoice Board of Directors, but he previously served as the, I'm going to do this in reverse order, uh, Chairman of the Security and Exchange Commission. He was White House, White House Counsel on, for President Reagan, so these are not actually going in order. But he was also a member of Congress for 17 years for Orange County, and we were just discussing that he had three different uh, districts that he represented, but pretty much Orange County was, was, was your space there. Uh, he, in 1996, wrote the, and I realize you started in 1995, but uh, the landmark legislation that became known as the 26 words that created the internet, which is now Section 230. Chris's government experiment, uh, government, it probably was experiment, but experience complements his deep knowledge in the private sector that he gained during two decades as practicing law. So Chris, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Of course, happy to join you in person. Thanks. So let's start with the 26 words. Do you feel like that's an accurate representation of Section 230? Well, I, I think the book is, is uh, a splendid work of history, documenting what happened that brought us to the need for the law in the first place. And the title is a catchy one. But the 26 words technically are a portion of what we now know prosaically as Section 230, and they're an important portion, but there's more to the law than just those 26 words. Uh, the 26 words go to whether or not uh, when an online portal hosts content created by users, uh, the online portal or the users or both are liable. And it says that the online portal is not liable if its user created that content. That's the 26 words. But the rest of the statute also matters because it says that if the online portal becomes involved in either the creation of that content or its subsequent development, then it's a content creator itself and it has no protection, no immunity of any kind under Section 230. So a little bit of misunderstanding that flows from people, and I don't blame the book on this, I think it's a catchy title and the book itself is thoroughly explanatory. But, uh, but for some people, that oversimplification you know, is the basis for a, a lot of logical uh, fallacy that proceeds. So I actually have a podcast called Explain to Shane, which I've been very lucky to have you as a guest. But in the middle of a lot of heated discussion about three years ago, a friend of mine wrote me and he said, how, how have you not done a piece on Section 230 yet when there was a lot of congressional fervor around how, what was allowable and not allowable on um, online presence or content, which it's still today. And since then, we are seeing not only Congress, but the states get engaged. So we're going to have a, a whole group of lawyers up here in just a minute. But let's start at the, at the kind of macro level. So a lot of confusion between Section 230 and the First Amendment. Can you just start to unbraid that for us? Sure. Um, both have application in online spaces. Uh, both are obviously important in their own ways, and they intersect. Uh, but the First Amendment, if this were a Venn diagram, uh, is inclusive of all. Uh, it's much bigger than Section 230 is. Section 230 you know, is a statute that allocates liability in certain circumstances. The First Amendment goes to the entire concept of speech, what it is, uh, what the government can do, uh, when it operates in that environment, uh, trying to regulate it, uh, and what people can do, uh, and what the government cannot stop them from doing. Uh, those are big things. Uh, the First Amendment uh, restrains the government. It's part of the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights is all about what the government can't do and what the people are entitled to do. So when we apply the First Amendment in the online environment, to private platforms. Uh, the private platforms are not the government, uh, so they are not, by operation of the First Amendment, restrained, uh, but they have rights against the government from being restrained. 
when they exercise their own speech rights, which include what we now think of as content moderation. So when uh, someone says on the internet, I think, and then they proceed, a user, um, I think that Adolf Hitler is really cool, and I think that Adolf Hitler is related to candidate X. Uh, the platform can say, that's not happening here. Uh, you don't get to say that. Uh, and the First Amendment gives them that right. It isn't Section 230, uh, but the First Amendment. You, you made an interesting point in an earlier conversation that we were having about the difference between, let's say, newspapers who have the opportunity to review what's going on because it isn't a, the live forum. And I thought that was an interesting perspective for people that have a hard time delineating why the things that they see online may not have been things that they'd seen previously before when the Internet was now our most often used medium for finding information. Can you kind of tell us why that idea of, you know, why there were certain things you did when it was a... a I don't call it flat because that's what it is in my head, but um, uh, you know the the previous world of newspapers versus what we have now, which is live content that's ever growing. Yeah, uh, that that is really the fulcrum of this whole discussion, because prior to the emergence of the internet as a new thing, uh, which was happening in the '80s and the '90s, uh, government regulated various kinds of communications. And all of them had something in common. Uh, radio, television, newspapers, magazines, all of them had lots of subscribers or lots of viewers or lots of listeners. And they all broadcast, as it were, or published from a single point. So if you and I wanted to start a magazine, we could do so and we could sell it to the whole country. And we were the gatekeepers of what went into that magazine and all the people that we sold it to were passive readers. Uh, with television, uh, even more passive viewers, right? Uh, a little less intellectual engagement in a lot of television. Uh, but the, it, it was essentially, if this were an algebraic equation, you've got a little quantity on one side, which is the few people that are editing, and a big quantity on the other side, which is the thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of people that are the passive consumers. Now, here comes the internet. The internet says, uh, if you're able to hook up to this network that is planetary, uh, you can be a publisher. And everybody converges on a handful of platforms. Uh, so now the platform, it's just the reverse equation. The big quantity is the content creators uh, and the little quantity is the people that are the portal that are published that are you know quote publishing it. So we and this you know this is all happening in real time by the way. Um, so your opportunity to publish is not just local but it's planetary. So uh, what 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 happens as a result of this? What happens is that uh, if I'm a little business, I can reach the whole planet uh, at very little expense, just whatever it costs me to hook up to the internet essentially. Uh, I don't have to uh, limit myself to a, a local region. Uh, if I am a, a polemicist and I wish to share my views on politics with people, I don't have to wear a sandwich sign anymore. I don't have to hope that they publish my letter to the editor. I can now you know, be read by people all over the place. Uh, these are wonderful things. And not only that, but we solve problems faster. I don't, you probably noticed that the pace of life has picked up. Uh, but it's not just true in politics. It's true in science. It's true in virtually every uh, aspect of human endeavor that more people focused on problems and exchanging ideas in real time means things get done a lot faster and progress happens more quickly. So these are all wonderful features of this new technology. If now, fast forward to the third decade of the 21st century, we want to treat this as if it is a magazine, a newspaper, a TV station, or a radio station, we're going to put the brakes on the internet. We're going to say, okay, no more real-time communication because now we want the portal to sift through all this stuff, which used to be real-time communication, and decide whether this belongs up or not. Uh, you can't have it both ways. If the internet is going to be the internet, then we have to regulate it differently. And 230, to get us back to Section 230, uh, 
proceeds from that premise that we want the internet to have these qualities. I love planetary. I usually say galactical, but that's assuming that there's a lot of entities we haven't yet met might care about. Well, these this. radio we'll waves planetary. can, you know, sometimes <laughs> proceed into space, and and whoever's out there may have views on this. <laughs> I'm going to think about that for a long time. Um, so we we it has been interesting with the war in Ukraine, and I recently wrote a piece about why we need to keep the internet connected in Russia. You know, there was a group of people that thought we should do our best to use our network capability to cleave off Russia from having internet access, which seems to me to be the worst thing to do because people should be able to have access to information. And then we've had an, another conversation here in the United States, which has been much more, um, I'll say parochial, but uh, maybe um, intramural, about our politicians and what should stay up and what shouldn't stay up. And, and that is part of where I think this constant conflation of Section 230 and the First Amendment come about. And you have had a lot to say about that lately, especially in the states of Texas and Florida. So tell us what is going on now at the, the court level and, and your interaction there. Sure. So Texas and Florida are two states that at the state level are approaching regulation of Section 230 from the standpoint that there is too much content moderation on the Internet. Uh, in other states and in Congress, uh, there is also a significant faction that thinks that there is not enough content moderation. Uh, so to give some examples, uh, you know, the Hunter Biden laptop story is, is notorious. Uh, during the election season, uh, that story uh, was uh, moderated. It was kept from public view on, on significant platforms. Uh, and that is a lot of impetus for the kind of regulation that Texas and Florida are doing. You should not be able to hold back from people when they are voting, you know, important news stories. This was a story that was in the New York Post newspaper, of course. One of my favorites, yes, Love yeah. the Post. Yeah. At the same time, uh, you've got uh, uh, countries uh, that are hostile to the United States uh, that want to put propaganda uh, into the mainstream of what U.S. news consumers read uh, and, and hear about. Uh, and you've got... Uh, uh, misinformation about public health issues, and you've got uh, misinformation about uh, scientific issues, uh, and people in Congress want something to be done about this. Uh, they certainly don't want our elections manipulated by foreign powers. Uh, and so given the space, the big space that's occupied by social media in America, shouldn't something be done about this? So that's the other, other angle of attack on Section 230. Section 230, however, uh, doesn't tell you how to answer either of those questions. What it says is that content moderation needs to be handled platform by platform, and rules need to be established by online communities according to their community standards. The reason for this is that if the government attempts to do it, first of all, the First Amendment gets in the way when the government tries to regulate speech in almost any way. Uh, uh, but second, uh, government is not very competent uh, at figuring out the answer to political questions. Uh, in our democracy, Democrats and Republicans, usually it's one or the other two parties, uh, are in charge at any given moment. Uh, they have all the political appointments in Washington, D.C., and in federal offices around the country and in regulatory agencies. And those people are going to put the thumb on the scale and say, this is good political speech and that's bad political speech. And half the time, everybody's going to hate it uh, because it's going to be the other side that gets to be in charge of these things. By letting a 1,000 flowers bloom and by having competition in the marketplace where we have choices, then we have a better answer to that problem. That's the premise of Section 230. So your amicus brief that you filed on Friday with Texas. So what's going on in Texas? Yep. So Texas is saying that uh, uh, platforms cannot discriminate against user content based on viewpoint. Uh, but viewpoint is not really defined in the statute. And of course, if you think about it, 
everything expresses a viewpoint of one kind or another. So ultimately, uh, we get a little bit too close to the anything goes model that was uh, one of the reasons that I that, uh, wrote this legislation with Senator Ron Wyden, then Representative Ron Wyden in the first place. Uh, you've got to have some rules of the road to have even the most robust political discussion or else uh, all the, the uh, F-bombs and the harassment and the ad hominem and the really uh, either illogical or immoral or what have you, uh, you know, overcomes uh, the substance of, of what people are trying to discuss. So if we're going to have, you know, some content moderation standards, the government is going to be you know, usually the worst person to do it. Uh, but inevitably, when government is the tool, uh, even conservatives come up with that answer. So do you think that this is heading towards the Supreme Court? Yes, I do. I do. The First Amendment uh, is, is going to uh, protect the platforms uh, because they are private from the action of the government as regulator. Uh, that's the argument that NetChoice made in its lawsuit in Texas and also in Florida, and it, it was sustained uh, in the first round of litigation in both states. Uh, not clear what happens next uh, you know, with courts. Uh, uh, you never know how they're going to handle issues. Uh, so you could end up having a split between the circuits. Uh, there could be other states that get involved in this. You might have three or four or five different circuit opinions. At some point, uh, there's no question the Supreme Court will become involved in this, but I think it's likely that even one of these two cases is going to make it there. That's, that's interesting. And I highly recommend reading his amicus brief. I spent Saturday night doing that. It was it's, you know, I <laughs> personally find there is nothing more exciting than reading an amicus curiae brief. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's well written. Several of them yeah, are, actually. Yeah. Uh, another colleague of ours over at uh, T Tech Freedom, I think it was, I got a, he had a great quote. Um, uh, he called it the... Uh, uh, he said, HB 20 is a First Amendment train wreck, was the opening of his piece. So that's from um, Corbin Berthold <clears throat> at uh, Tech Freedom. I thought, you know, that's, that kind of gets your attention in the beginning. You're like, train wreck. I think I want to read about that. That'll be fascinating. Well, and, it, and it's true. It is. Uh, because uh, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, and the First Amendment has been held to apply to the states as well, so states shall make no law. It's a pretty concise amendment. It's a, it's a pretty uh, specific expression of constitutional authority, no law. It doesn't say, you know, Almost no law. It says no law, uh, and and so that's a that's a big roadblock. So getting a little more in the weeds, there's another fun discussion we have here is between C1 and C2. So can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah, this is another area that I find just endlessly stimulating, and exciting. Um, along with reading amicus briefs, is the C1, C2. <laughs> Don't make fun uh, of us. We like this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But to put this in plain English. Uh, C1 is the part of, of uh, Section 230 that says that the platform is not going to be treated as if it's the publisher of what its users actually create. Uh, C2 says, well, we're going to make an exception in this, in this circumstance if uh, you are moderating content, uh, then you will not be treated as if you were the creator of the content. Uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to take down content or restrict access to it uh, if it is obscene or if it is harassing or if it's excessively violent or things along that line, uh, then you will be protected. Uh, Remember, I, I mentioned earlier that there's another part that's not C1 or C2 of Section 230 that says that you yourself are going to be a content creator, uh, just like your users, if you become involved. In it, and it says even in part uh, in the subsequent development of content that somebody else created. So we needed an exception. It's called the Good Samaritan exception in that portion of the statute in C2. 
uh, and if you are actually reviewing content and if you are making a decision about it to, to take it down or what have you, uh, you are fully protected for that reason. So let's get to some real world examples. This has been fun to live in legal world, but uh, Elon Musk gives us lots of fodder, especially around Twitter and what he should or shouldn't be doing. What are some of the, the market challenges around content? Well, uh, we noticed uh, that Elon Musk uh, recently became the largest shareholder in Twitter. Uh, what this tells us is that there's a vibrant marketplace, as we would hope, uh, in ownership and governance of social media. Uh, the original platforms that were the impetus for the creation of Section 230 are names that are not known to some of the young people in the audience here today, I think, uh, unless they have studied the history here, uh, because they're not around any longer. Um, even before we had America Online, uh, which was one of the pioneers, we had Prodigy and we had CompuServe and subsequently had MySpace, and MySpace was going to take over the world. Uh, things change. Uh, you know, IBM was going to take over the world uh, as well. Uh, it was the dominant monopolist in everything about computers, but that changed. So uh, for my money, the marketplace is your best guarantee. Protecting that marketplace is very important. We need to make sure that there's real competition and that competition benefits consumers. Uh, but if we do that, if we follow those rules, then I think we'll have the best approach. Never will it be perfect uh, to solving these problems. Sorry, that's my, my watch telling me that we're supposed to go to questions. Apologies for that. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to say that out loud. Um, so, no, I think your marketplace point, I'm always a big, you know, the market usually gets there much faster than anybody who wants to regulate, and we regulate so far behind the power curve. By the time we think we've put the solution to bed, we've, we've moved far beyond it, and we're like, why are we putting this regulation in place? Um, so that, that'll be interesting. Okay, so questions from the audience, and apologies, because I'm going to read these live out loud. Okay. Um, if you are a conservative who is upset about Twitter blocking the account of former President Trump or upset about Twitter's handling of the Hunter Biden laptop story, are you supposed to just sit quietly and let Twitter figure this out, like Twitter figures anything out? That's my print in my head. Uh, or is there some narrow reform to online speech liability that you can support, given that uh, taking a cudgel to Section 230 is a bad idea? What should we do? Well, one of the things that's happening because of free speech and because of the many avenues for free speech is that people are complaining about content moderation policies they don't like. That's the marketplace of ideas. And that works. There's a lot of, I mean, the reason that we're still talking about the Hunter Biden laptop story is that it's on everybody's lips. Uh, it's not as if uh, any suppression of this has been effective of late. Uh, and social media is one of the places, perhaps the biggest place, that this is currently being discussed. So uh, the pressure that social media is able to put on social media itself may very well result in the best resolution of this with content moderation policies that are more sensitive to things like this. OK, uh, question two. I think we just and, started... and let me just add, yeah. you know, if the cudgel that we want to pick up uh, is government regulation, you know, for coming at it from a conservative perspective, you know, good luck with that. Because if you don't like what these faceless people who are moderating your content on Twitter are doing, just wait till it's the faceless people who are, you know, ultimately under the jurisdiction of political appointees in Washington. Or the algorithm that they've designed. Uh, so question two, I think we've kind of touched on this, but what do you think about Elon Musk buying a majority stake in Twitter? We'll go ahead and pass this one because I think we just had that conversation. Uh, three, a lot of people point fingers towards Facebook as one of the most problematic platforms in terms of content moderation. Do you have a complete faith that free market competition would allow competing platforms which are better at moderating content to dislodge such a behemoth because some of the conservative free speech platforms have not been doing well. I think you kind of got that on the, when we were talking about the market, but any other thoughts since someone posed that question? Yeah, I mean, that's the right question, I think. Uh, and I don't have 
a completely satisfying answer, which is to say an answer that satisfies me, uh, <laughs> let alone anyone else, uh, because uh, I would like to think that markets not only can be efficient, but that they can be productive of you know, ultimately the best answer uh, to a lot of these challenges. And yet, you know, when it comes to the political disposition of most media, uh, it isn't just social media, but when I look at newspapers, when I look at uh, you know, network television, when I look at most cable TV, uh, actually all cable TV because it seems all tendentious, um, and, and when I look at Hollywood, and when I look at the major book publishers, and when I look at universities, you know, I've served on university boards of trustees for over 20 years. Uh, I don't see the kind of intellectual diversity that I would like, the political diversity that I would like. Uh, so, you know, I ask myself, why does the market not do better? Uh, so I can continue to bay at the moon about that like, like other conservatives, but uh, I don't feel comfortable uh, saying that putting the government in charge of fixing this problem is going to make it better. Uh, I'm even more certain that that's the wrong answer uh, than I am uncertain about you know, why the marketplace isn't doing better. So uh, let's see. Our next question is, what incident or trend motivated you to actually create Section 230? You talked about that with Prodigy. Is there any other part of the narrative story you want to bring up there? Yeah. Um, uh, let's, let's go back to the 1990s when, when this was all happening. Um, I was a computer aficionado for a very particular reason. Um, I had started a business uh, translating Pravda, the Soviet Union's largest daily newspaper, at a time when uh, there was no English translation regularly available uh, anywhere in the world. And we sold it in 26 countries around the world for the reason that people needed to see what Soviet propaganda design for the Russians uh, looked like. We had Soviet propaganda design for us that we could see in our own country. Uh, the USA Canada Institute was run by the Soviet Union at that time, uh, and they had access to our television. Uh, we all you know, soaked up all of that Soviet propaganda here. But what they said in Pravda was uh, so blatantly false uh, and so obviously propagandistic that when you showed an English translation of that newspaper to anyone in America, they immediately became a little more anti-communist. Um, <laughs> in order to put that business together, I had to, uh, you know, we, we, I say I, it was a team. Uh, we put together over 50 translators, uh, and they were located all about the country, hooked up uh, by computer, by computer modem. Uh, and this is the 1980s. You know, it's a little early. The IBM PCs had just arrived on the scene. When we started the company, that very year was the year that Max came out. And, and so understanding that technology uh, in that deep way uh, you know, made me what we would today call an early adopter. That's why I was on Prodigy as a service. That's why I was on CompuServe as a service. And I understood the difference. So when I read in the Wall Street Journal that courts had treated Prodigy and CompuServe differently when it came to content moderation because CompuServe didn't do any at all and Prodigy did, uh, it really uh, caught my attention. I mean, it just uh, really upset me because what it said is if you don't moderate content at all, which CompuServe could get away with in those days uh, because everybody was so much more civilized, it was all early adopters, you know, techies that were on there, um, but, but if you don't moderate, then you won't be liable for what somebody says. But what one person says that may not be true uh, that's on your platform will get you in trouble uh, to the tune of millions and tens of millions of dollars uh, if you have rules of the road that say don't harass people, uh, don't bully people, don't... Uh, uh, don't get in the way of reasoned discussion. That was the rule that was on Prodigy at the time, which I thought was a good rule. 
So why can't Prodigy have such a rule, and why are you going to penalize them for it and expose them to massive liability? Uh, that's why Section 230 is there. Did you do actual transliteration? So you just yeah. So the the paper that we reproduced was was an exact reproduction, the same newsprint, which was uh, inferior to U.S. newsprint. It was also a different size piece of paper. The Cyrillic alphabet and the Roman alphabet have common characters, so we could match all the fonts. We reproduced all the photographs. The occasionally they'd have an editorial cartoon, radio, TV listings, everything. So you picked it up. It was just like if you laid them side by side, they looked identical except that one was magically English. Huh, interesting. I'm reading a book on the Yalta conference right now, and they're explaining the difference between translators and interpreters. Because trans, you know, transliteration, but sometimes it doesn't always come across on the interpretation. There's also a great line where FDR said he didn't like the State Department. He called them cookie pushers, which I thought was probably the funniest line in the entire book so far. Um, <laughs> last question, and then we're going to go to the panel. It says, it seems to me that Section 230 is a hammer and looks to the Democrats like a way of hammering disinformation or non-DNC authored propaganda, particularly those of their enemies. Like Russia or the RNC, the deplorable Americans who do not agree with their views, the Republicans it looks like a, a way to guarantee conservative speech. Are we better off looking for other ways to protect all free speech? I'm just reading that out loud. <laughs> well, when we get to the very end of that question, I think uh, we have an explanation, if not an answer. And it is that the First Amendment gives platforms the opportunity to have a point of view. Uh, Section 230 doesn't say in its statutory text that it applies to Facebook or that it applies to Twitter. It applies to virtually any online platform. Uh, and there are literally hundreds of millions of websites available to us on our phones right now as Americans. Uh, all of them regulated by Section 230 to the extent that they include user-created content. The Democrats have their own website. Uh, Republicans have their own website. A lot of people in this room have politically oriented platforms uh, that they're either associated with or that they manage and run. Uh, the First Amendment says that they get to exclude content that doesn't fit with their model. Uh, so there are many reasons that you can not carry certain kinds of content on your online platform. They could be political. They could be simply logical. If my platform is about shoemaking, I don't have to put things up there about knitting, uh, you know, and on and on. Uh, the idea the in Section 230... way of saying that ever. I'm going to remember that one. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah it, 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 you know, sometimes, even in lawsuits, I see the preamble to Section 230 from the statute quoted, and it... it refers to a true diversity of opinion and a true diversity of discourse. The way that Section 230 envisions this happening is on a multitude of platforms, each free to have their own content moderation standards, each free to have their own community guidelines. Not one platform with one set of rules managed by the government that says, here's how it's going to work. Uh, that would be the, the opposite of diversity. You know, in theory, you know, we could have anything goes, uh, which was the state of the law before Section 230. Uh, and in that case, everybody would be dropping F-bombs. Not everybody, but the, 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 everybody would be drowned out by all of, of the vulgarity, all the incivility, all the harassment, and so on. And everybody would just throw up their arms and say, I want nothing to do with this anymore. If the government, which is restrained by the First Amendment, uh, were to have a true public square, just to take the limiting logical case, you know, then you'd have the government operating uh, Facebook.gov, uh, and you could say whatever you want because it's allowed by the First Amendment. So you could say Hitler is cool all day long. Uh, you could even call for violence as long as you didn't come right up to that line where it was imminent. Uh, uh, and people would hate that, too. It would be a disaster. It would be uh, uh, certainly not a commercial success if it tried to charge people a dollar for coming on it. 
as a girl who loves shoes, I love the idea that you can talk about shoes and not knitting them. I'm all for that. Um, thank, thank you for your one-on-one -on -one time. Now we're going to bring our panel to, uh, panelists up. Please up, come on up, and I will introduce them along the way uh, so we can have a, an even more robust conversation about the same topics. So uh, Daniel Lyons, who's going to join us here, is a, a, is a colleague of mine, a non-resident senior fellow at AEI, where he focuses on Section 230, FCC issues, the Supreme Court, and antitrust law. Last December, he testified in front of the House Subcommittee on Communications and Technology about the potential unintended consequences of Section 230 reform. In addition to his fellowship at AEI, he's an Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and a professor at the, um, of law at Boston College Law School, Daniel. Uh, before his career in academia, Daniel was practicing attorney at Munger, Tolls, and Olson, and a clerk for Judge, Judge Cynthia Holcomb Hall at the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit. Jeff Rosen recently joined us about, I don't know, eight months ago here at AEI, so I was very excited when I realized that he was a colleague. He is, so is a non-resident uh, fellow here at AEI, a distinguished senior fellow at the uh, George Mason University's Gray Center for Study of the Administrative State. At AEI, he specializes in administrative law and regulation, constitutionalism, legal institutions, while following technology issues, which I'm going to drag him into lots of them here. Before joining AEI, Jeff served as the Acting Attorney General and Deputy Attorney Generals of the United States, uh, Deputy Secretary of Transportation under Elaine Chao, and as well as General Counsel and Senior Policy Advisor at the White House Office of Management and Budget, OMB. While serving at a, as Attorney General, Jeff supervised the implementation of important federal initiatives such as combating cybercrime, antitrust reviews, and social media platforms. So he's well versed in this area. And uh, Benjamin Witte joins us is, uh, from Brookings. He's also doing a, a whole series of events on content moderation, so you should follow him at Brookings as well. He's a senior fellow in governance studies, where he researches uh, his research covers Section 230, cybersecurity, and democracy. Uh, his Section 230 project aims to convene preeminent thought leaders and to inform on Section 230 policy landscape and chart a viable path forward. Outside of Section 230 work, Ben is a law analysis on both NBC News and MSNBC. He's also the contributing writer at The Atlantic. He co-founded and is the editor-in-chief of Lawfare. So, hello, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us up here on the, on the stage. Ben, I'm going to start with you uh, because you brought up a very good uh, point when we were talking the other day about there are so many issues that are conflated in the 230 discussion. So we've discussed the First Amendment, but there are a few others. Can you kick off with that? Yeah. So um, a few years ago, uh, my, my colleague and I, uh, uh, Danielle Citrin, uh, wrote a what we thought was a highly provocative law review article, which was a suggestion for 230 reform. And the uh, idea of it was of changing 230 was so unthinkable at the time, and this wasn't very long ago, that we, uh, in an abundance of caution, entitled the article, uh, The Internet Will Not Break, in a sort of defensive crouch against the idea that the onslaught we expected. Um, in a very short period of time, I think largely because of uh, 2016 and Russian uh, interference in the election, that landscape changed completely over, almost overnight. And today, as you say, people suggest reforming 230 for this wild range of stuff that is, frankly, the proposals are completely non-responsive to. So I just want to tick off a few to try to clear some of the brush. Uh, the first is, I, you hear this mostly from the left, um, but uh, hate speech, right? Like, you'll often hear a lot of people say, we got to deal with the hate speech problem. The, the solution somehow lies in the reform of 230. And a you know, bit of tough love to my friends on the left. It's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is that um, you know, if you got rid of 230 and you made the platforms liable for every bit of hate speech that applied to them, <clears throat> the hate speech is still constitutionally protected at least as such. And so uh, you would actually run into a First Amendment wall of trying to hold platforms liable, just as, in fact, you hold 
you run into a First Amendment wall trying to hold individuals responsible for a lot of hate speech. Uh, the second area, and this is uh, endemic on the political right, and in fact showed up in uh, one of the questions uh, to uh, uh, Chairman Cox in the last segment, uh, this idea that, um, and the former president is the chief uh, proponent of this idea, that you can somehow deal with the perceived political balance problem on social media by, as uh, President Trump used to say, repeal Section 230. Um, and if you think about it for a minute, this is almost total nonsense. Uh, so imagine a world without Section 230, um, which immunizes the platforms for content moderation decisions as well as the hosting decisions. What would that require? It would require dramatically more content moderation, not less, because the platforms would have to think about, would I be liable for leaving this piece of content up? And, uh, and so the evidence of this, by the way, is that these various uh, social media platforms that have proliferated, including uh, uh, Trump's own, uh, Truth Social, uh, all have very aggressive content moderation uh, or terms of service for content that they don't like, and they rely on 230 for the vitality of those. Um, and so, uh, these are kind of fantasies, I think, but they drive a lot of the discussion of 230 reform. I want to point to, I think, three areas very briefly where the, con the discussion should focus. Uh, the first is illegal activity of one sort or another on uh, platforms. Right now, platforms uh, have relatively little incentive to uh, police this material because uh, they're, as if it's third party contributed content, they're generally immunized for its production. This affects a lot of different areas. The, some platforms are way better about this than others. Um, but there is one area, or two areas actually, where the, uh, where the, the law creates real exceptions to 230. Uh, the most important of them is the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And if you just observe that, wow, the platforms are way, way, way more aggressive about uh, policing uh, uh, copyright violations than they are about policing a lot of other types of illegal activities, that's a reflection of the fact that illegal activity online is actually an area where you can incentivize with tweaks to 230, you can create disincentives. The second area that I just want to flag, and that, by the, that first area has about 10 different subcategories, which we can talk about, but I'm going to leave it out for now. The second area, uh, which I think is, is a really interesting area of potential reform, involves um, algorithmic promotion of content. Um, and so if you say, well, the, the platform is immunized for the posting of the content, right? That's third party contributed content. But then the platform makes its own decisions about which, plat which material to promote. And whether that question, that decision to promote content by Chris Cox, but not by Jeff Rosen, whether that constitutes some sort of editorial decision that fits under the category of that which the content, the, the carrier is potentially liable for, or whether it doesn't, actually has huge implications uh, that uh, we can talk about. And by the way, uh, is incredibly difficult to define legislatively. So that's, I think, a, a very broad landscape of where I, think, where I think the conversation is fantastical and where I think the conversation is not fantastical. 
Thank you for that. Um, Daniel, you had a piece in this morning's techpolicydaily.com here at AEI where um, you uh, did a piece with uh, Will Rao, and you specifically talked about Truth Social and Getter. What's, what's going on in that space? Yeah, I think the big takeaway, I think, from Truth Social and Getter and Gab and all these other sort of Twitter or uh, uh, next generation social media platforms is that content moderation is both hard and to some degree sort of necessary when you're operating a, a platform in order to avoid it from uh, devolving into a cesspool, right? So much of the promise of a lot of these um, new, fa uh, new social media platforms was in response to uh, uh, arguments about uh, traditional social media. It's fun to say traditional social media now, just to like, I know, it's like five, ten years old. Traditional now? Uh, okay. Traditional social media was engaged in too much content moderation. So we're creating these new companies that are going to be all about free speech, right? Um, I, I think Parler's CEO said, uh, had the, the, the uh, headline, right? If you can say it on uh, the streets, streets of New, New York, York, you can say it on Parler. That gives you a lot of leeway. Right. Well, too much leeway, as it turns out, right? Because um, they quickly learned that. Um, allowing sort of anybody to post at all times quickly turns every social media site into 4chan, right? Which is, um, A, not a place anybody wants to go, and B, um, uh, not really representative of at least what a traditional conservative uh, values would want to be promoting. So all of these companies that are sort of starting with this idea of uh, anybody can post whatever they want and we're not going to moderate them quickly run into the reality that some moderation is going to be necessary in order to attract um, uh, and keep users. So the question isn't, should we engage in content moderation or not? The question is, what content moderation policies are we going to be engaging in? And I think it's a great idea if different companies are experimenting with different content moderation tools, right? because then we as consumers have a choice of which platform we want to go to, some of which are more generous than others, um, and, and which end up uh, providing a different uh, portfolio of content available to uh, to the, the information marketplace of, of uh, Web 2.0. Uh, but the, 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 I think the key takeaway from these experiments is that you can't really achieve that sort of Trump right dream of a uh, social media platform free of content moderation. What we're really arguing about is what kind of moderation um, different pockets of Americans or different pockets of users worldwide are interested in, in engaging. Any comments on that before I move to Jeff? Thoughts? His, his blog spot on? I think that's exactly right. Okay. I mean, I, like, <laughs> you know, this is a free speech. Everybody at AEI believes in free speech. And yet, if I start screaming obscenities right now, uh, somebody will come and politely escort me out. It will um, definitely be a polite escort. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and, you know, that's called content moderation. And it's not, it's not really in tension with free speech. Um, I think, I mean, I think the point is exactly correct. Great. Jeff, you have some very specific questions that you've asked at a couple different forums, and you, I, I was really stuck with the idea that the, the two words otherwise objectionable sticks in mm -hmm. your space. So, like, what, tell no. us what's up with that. So, so, it goes back to, you referenced earlier, the C1, C2 jargon. Mm -hmm. The 26 words that created the internet are actually uh, C1. Right, that's just, is, is Prodigy or CompuServe or AOL or, or in, nowadays Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, YouTube, going to be responsible for content that someone else provided, posted on their thing? And the answer to that is no. For a long time, there were hundreds, I think thousands now of cases about what's covered, what claims are covered, what parties and so forth, but that part, is no longer really that controversial. And I don't, I don't think it, it really needs to be. I think there's widespread support for the basic concept um, that the platform's not responsible for things other people posted uh, in a general sense. Ironically, and, and uh, <clears throat> Chris Cox alluded to this, now the, the demands really are for taking things down. Some people, uh, as, as Ben said, some people on the left would say, there needs to be more policing of disinformation. There needs to be policing of offensive material. People on the right concerned about uh, uh, bi bias, viewpoint discrimination, censorship type uh, issues. So it's what should come down. <clears throat> and Section 230 is not the, the whole thing. It's, it's immunity, which is to create incentives 
And the way the statute was written, it largely focused on that there would be immunity for taking down things that, for the most part, not exclusively, would be illegal. It, the, the things that there was immunity for taking down were things that were obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing. But, and I don't think there's tremendous controversy about those, perhaps some ambiguity, but, but those are, for the most part, illegal type content. But then it said, or otherwise objectionable. There would be immunity for removing content that was otherwise objectionable. Well, what is that? Is that anything? Is that totally arbitrary? We're taking it down because we don't want any posts from uh, Jewish people? You know? What, what is that? And to me, that's where uh, the statutory problem is that needs to be addressed in some manner. Now, how to address it? I think uh, forums like this are a good place to start and having thoughtful people like the, the panelists here. But um, I think there does need to be some refinement that creates actual standards for there to be immunity. And, and I would say the phrase otherwise objectionable either needs to be construed consistent with the illegal type behaviors that are in the statute or needs to be changed um, in some manner. Daniel. Daniel, you can go first. Sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'll take the counterpoint. I think um, relating to my earlier comment that, you know, content moderation is hard. I think from a policy perspective, we want to encourage uh, different companies to try to throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks, to try different types of content moderation. The problem with experimenting with new and different models of moderation, um, if you have liability for a takedown, would be that um, companies would, be, would experiment less right, for fear of, of liability. So uh, one, con one concern, would, I think, would be sort of the effect that would have, the unintended consequence that would have on content moderation development. Um, the other is, I guess, the question, um, assuming the shield from liability goes away, right, C2 goes away, what's the claim right, that, that could be asserted? Uh, I, I can see sort of a uh, terms and conditions violation claim, but uh, social media companies are usually pretty good about writing their terms and conditions to give themselves a lot of discretion. Um, and then anything that's not sort of a breach of contract would seem to be um, uh, covered by the uh, First Amendment right of editorial control. So... If I can, oh, yeah. can jump right into that. Remember, removing immunity does not automatically create liability. Just as you were, you were getting at, there still has to be some other valid claim that the, the moderation activity is improper in some way. So it could be breach of contract under the, the terms of service, but it could be something else. But part of what taking away the immunity would do would allow some experimentation on regulatory approaches I would agree with, with Chris Cox that we don't want some big brother federal agency that says we look over the shoulder of the platforms and say this one should stay, this one should go. That'd be horrendous. But uh, there may be other processes uh, or regulatory approaches that simply say a user who's been excluded has to have some due process from the entity itself, from the platform itself. Uh, Historically, Reuters had created uh, trust principles and a, a board that tries to enforce those. Facebook has currently the oversight board. These are you know, processes that have strengths and weaknesses, but some companies, uh, like Twitter, don't even have that. They have nothing. So uh, to leave space for um, uh, process regulation in particular seems to me to be a good idea. And there may be situations where there are substantive claims. Whether the First Amendment uh, applies or not, you know, is very fact specific. The, uh, there's a, a, a long discussion to be had about that that maybe we can touch on. But uh, I just think, why would you give unfettered immunity for taking down literally anything the platform owner wants? Why is there immunity for taking down something on knitting? Okay, it may be that they want to take it down, but why are they immune for it? If it's, if it's not improper to take it down, they don't need immunity. If it is improper, why would they get immunity for that? Yeah, so can I just ask, ask you both, um, because I'm, I'm trying to envision 
what the regime what what the regime that you're you're imagining looks like. So if you would you get rid of C2 altogether or would you just lop off the or otherwise objectionable language so you're immune if you take down um, uh, if if you take down lewd lascivious obscene stuff but you're uh, potentially assuming somebody has a cause of action and that there's actual liability you're potentially liable uh, for stuff short of that and uh, on the and on the current do, regime do either of you know how or otherwise objectionable has been interpreted I don't does it actually mean anything the platform writes into its terms of service um, or does it actually have some, does it have to be objectionable in some objective standard? So I'll say on the, on the latter, my understanding is there's not a lot of case law, if any, uh, interpreting the phrase. And part of it is because C1 has been interpreted really broadly by the courts to encompass any right. editorial decision by the platform. So the, the, a case that would raise that argument would go away on C1 grounds before you get to interpreting C2. Yeah, the, the, uh, I, I think at this point there's several thousand Section 230 court decisions, but as best I could tell, the number that have addressed otherwise objectionable, you, you could probably count on one hand, and they're more in passing than, than it's a clear holding of it. But they've tilted towards the broad construction consistent with C1, which is construed right. very broadly. But, does, to, but to, doesn't that imply that <clears throat> nothing turns on the language? In, uh, no, I don't think so, because... Uh, as I was alluding to, for most of the last 25 years, the litigation that's arisen wasn't really about moderation. It was about who was covered, what types of claims, if the, uh, are you protected from a claim involving housing discrimination as opposed to defamation, because defamation is pretty clear. Uh, it took a while to sort out what types of claims, what type of entities. It was very obvious, right, that Prodigy and CompuServe were covered, but who else counts as a I think the statutory term is interactive service provider. A lot of litigation about who, who that is. So this, this focus on content moderation has really grown more in the last, call it five years, let's say, maybe slightly longer, where that's, that's become the big demand of they're taking down too much, they're taking down too little, depending on, on points of view. Um, to answer your question, from my point of view, um, I would not get rid of all of C2. I, I think it is appropriate to have immunity for taking down what I'll call illegal content, obscene materials, te terrorist uh, communications, um, so uh, you know, imminent threats of violence, I'm going to kill you tomorrow morning, that sort of thing. So uh, I would not, from my, just my personal vantage point, I would not delete C2 altogether, but I think some refinements are in order and um, that the phrase otherwise objectionable is too carte blanche. So I, I'd love to bat clean up here. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot's been said uh, and I want to go after at least the mountain peaks. So just for starters, there is no case that says that if I run a knitting online platform and I take down shoemaking content, uh, that that decision is protected by Section 230. So when you say, why should it be? No court has ever said it is. That's the First Amendment. I mean, the reason platforms get to decide what goes on their platforms is not Section 230. It just is. Section 230 is not the source of any authority to take down anything. It is a restriction on liability. But the First Amendment, on the other hand, is my power as a citizen to speak. And that's the power that I exercise when I'm a platform and I say, damn it, this is a whole, well, I wouldn't even say damn it necessarily, depend, I'm a knitting platform. So, <laughs> so when I say darn it, uh, this stuff is coming down. Uh, that's my First Amendment right. Uh, second, with respect to otherwise objectionable. You know, try drafting a statute that gets at all the things that you mentioned. You know, terrorism. Uh, terrorism is not mentioned in Section 230, and yet we would want, and you would want, I heard you just express it, 
you would want platforms to have the ability to moderate terrorist content. So as the drafter of that language, uh, I'm, I feel good about having the otherwise objectionable tag at the end of that string of things because even following the canon of statutory construction, which in Latin is used in generous and, and it means and like things, uh, where it's not an empty vessel into which people can pour whatever thoughts they have about what they can moderate, but rather, you know, the otherwise objectionable means and things like that. So I can say, well, you know, excessive violence is one of the things that is specified in the statute and promoting terrorism is sure as heck like that. And therefore, if I'm a court, I'm going to say that's covered by Section 230. But we can imagine things also uh, like uh, uh, child sexual abuse uh, material. Uh, that's not specified in there, uh, although it might be by some amendment to Section 230. But I would contend that it's already covered because of all those words that we all know, you know, lewd, lascivious, this, that sort of thing. Uh, certainly CSAM is like that, right? So, so following normal canons of statutory construction, we've covered these things, but we haven't omitted illegal things that you know, maybe we weren't smart enough to think of. And, and we certainly don't want to have a disincentive to take down things that the online community thinks are truly offensive and illegal. And that's why you need some language that's very much like that. And I would just say that with all of the concern that's been raised about content moderation on the internet, there aren't any cases that say that otherwise objectionable is this runaway train that means whatever you want it to mean. Uh, when a platform takes things down for political reasons, it's exercising its First Amendment right, and, it, and 230 didn't authorize that. So, so three quick responses. One is I actually uh, would take your clarification that you thought otherwise objectionable should have been limited to other like things. But I don't think that's how it's being thought of by the platforms themselves or anybody else. But platforms Nor get to think about it that way uh, or not because of the First Amendment. And well, since gonna, no I'm court has ever that. said that 230 says what you say it means, I, I don't understand what and, the problem is. Well, and then you, you, you say otherwise objectionable is good because it captures some things not in the statute. I'd rather put those things in the no, statute. No, they are in the statute, and they've been following the long-standing canon of statutory construction of used and generous. It has to have some relation to the words that come before it. Uh, if you think about I why wish a court this is a say canon that, of statutory construction, it exists because otherwise you would be reading out those specific terms. If otherwise objectionable means just otherwise objectionable, why did we put all those other things before it? The courts are supposed to not erase and take a pencil out and erase words from a statute. They're supposed to give the whole statute meaning. So I think I feel very comfortable. I felt comfortable writing it, knowing this as a lawyer. I feel very comfortable now, 25 years later, looking at it, that that part of the statute works perfectly. Well, we're going to agree to disagree. Don't forget that there were uh, 400 and, was it, 24 other House members and 100 senators. Did they construe it that way at the time? Was that debated and discussed? But it doesn't, it doesn't matter either way. The, the words are, are Well, it's been are, debated are, are and discussed there. even more recently. I've, I've been testifying before the House and the Senate, taking questions on this from colleagues, uh, people that I know personally. I know pretty well how they think about it. You know, I think people are getting their arms around what can and can't be done to, to change Section 230. And, and they are not fastening on this because they recognize the courts have not made this a problem. So we're gonna... so can, 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 can I just say one thing on the yes. First Amendment issue? Because I don't, I don't want to totally let that go by. Um, it is, I agree that immunity and uh, what happens without immunity are separate issues. So if, if there was no immunity, there would still be questions as to is there a claim uh, of some other violation, and there would be an issue of does the First Amendment protect the speech uh, or the action of the platform. But... The place I have a, a, a question, at least, is whether the First Amendment actually provides protection for content moderation by a platform, because 
the, the concept is that the platform is not a publisher, is not the New York Times or the New York Post or these others. And if it, if it is, then there's a different set of issues. But if it's not, then there's a whole set of questions as to what First Amendment interests are at stake. And in general, I'm going to speak very broadly, the, the right of corporations to uh, free speech is premised in, in large part on the rights of the listeners. And it seems at least somewhat questionable whether it is in the listener's interest to be, for example, deprived of viewpoint moderation or to be deprived of the, the information on knitting if they want it. So who's going to decide that? And I don't think it's a given that the platform is the decider of those content decisions. I think that's a, a much harder question that hasn't actually been addressed as to whose First Amendment rights prevail uh, if there is no, immuni uh, no immunity. I think that's a, a much more complicated question than if it were just any of us as the speaker. We would clearly have First Amendment rights to say things that the content moderator may not have the right to do as a, as a corporate entity. Thoughts on that? I think it's a very interesting point. It's also a largely theoretical point at this point because we've never gotten anywhere near mm -hmm. testing it. But I think it's an, it's an interesting, I mean, the premise of C1 is that you're not allowed to, the language of the statute is treat as a publisher. And so whether that whether that changes the First Amendment analysis, is, I, it's a very interesting question. And, um, <clears throat> and just for what it's worth, uh, this year in Doe versus Facebook, Justice Thomas wrote a well-known concurrence now that says at some point the Supreme Court's going to have to consider some of these both Section 230 and constitutional issues um, and things. You know, are, are the platforms common carriers, for example, and things like that that would change the First Amendment analysis? I, I will say that as a as an actual publisher, as well as a longtime newspaper guy, um, I, I do think the uh, re reserving your point, which I, is, a, is a fascinating one, I do think the editorial judgment component of First, of First Amendment law is very hard to separate from the from the decision to publish. I, I mean, you know, one of the things that always irritates me about Section 230 is that it immunizes big, powerful companies for judgments that I, as a publisher of a small magazine, are, am in potentially liable for. If I, you know, I have this third-party submitted content, I. I edit it carefully, I do hard work on it, I, I publish it, and then unbeknownst to me, that person is a malicious fabricator, and I'm potentially liable for that. Um, uh, whereas, you know, if the same author throws it up on Medium or Facebook or, or, or has a long Twitter thread, they do none of that work, uh, they do uh, none of that care, and they are completely immune from, from, the, from the same defamation, um, which as a publisher, I have to say, does not strike me as fair or reasonable, um, just to inject my parochial view into it. Uh, that said, I've never considered the flip side of it, which is like, okay, well, what if you say treating them, not treating them as a publisher actually implies that they don't get the first, same First Amendment protection that I do. It's a very interesting and uh, frankly appealing uh, thought to me, although uh, I, I have uh, very high confidence that it does not have more than one or two justices that would, would buy it. So the difference between being a newspaper and being the internet is that I don't have to go ask you as the editor of the newspaper, if I can post my content. So if we want to go away from that world and go back to a world in which, in order to get my point of view out there, I have to write a letter to the editor and hope I get lucky. And I have a long experience writing 
letters to the editor not getting published. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> Is there over, a book in the future? Over a period of some, you know, 40 years before the internet happened. Uh, now I can, you know, get on real clear politics wherever I want, anytime I want. Uh, and so can everybody else in America, pretty near. Uh, you know, they can put their stuff up on, on lots of websites covering lots of topics. So we can go back to the world in which we have gatekeepers but that's not, certainly from a conservative complaint standpoint, that's not what conservatives are complaining about. They're not saying too much of our stuff is up there. They're saying too little. Uh, so you won't scratch that itch. And I'm afraid that for marginalized communities on the left, it's the same problem. They couldn't get published either. They couldn't get their letters to the editor printed. And you know, you know, these days, you know, LGBTQ and other communities that never had, you know, communities publicly of expression, you know, have all sorts of outlets. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, yes, it's unfair if you think that we're comparing apples and apples, that one is treated differently, but these are very different things. And if we want the internet to have its qualities that distinguish it from newspapers, we can't have newspaper style, radio style, television style, magazine style regulation. So I actually agree with that. And when I say uh, it has irritated me, and I, I don't actually mean that I don't think it's the right general posture. I do think it creates very weird anomalies uh, uh, within, you know, for conventional media and for even for people like me who are very non-conventional conventional media you know, the New York Times is liable for every op-ed and immune for every comment. That's a weird situation. But the New York Times, if I may add, you know, has opportunities for readers to post their comments online and so on, and while they choose to moderate them, they are not liable under Section 230 for that. No, that's what I mean. For every op-ed they decide to publish is potentially a liability, and every comment that some third party posts, they're immune for. It's a weird hybrid environment. So I've and, had this discussion a couple of times with uh, radio talk show hosts, which uh, it's kind of amusing to hear them say, like, I'm worried that I'm, I'm being stifled to radio talk shows. Uh, tend to be sort of fairly open into what they're going to say online. Right. Um, but I guess the, the question that comes up in those is, 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 your, is the challenge an issue with 230 or is it an issue with the way defamation law works offline, which I think is a little bit different. I might agree with you that publisher, traditional publisher liability may put the publishers too much uh, on, on the hook too much, but then the sense is that 230 is that we should level up as opposed to leveling down. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not complaining about the position that it puts... Uh, traditional publishers in. What I am saying is that uh, uh, Attorney General Rosen's observation that it's weird to have one passage that says shall not be treated as a publisher and then flip around and talk about the residual First Amendment rights mm -hmm. that are there anyway has a certain instinctive resonance with me. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm more reflecting on his point than I am uh, that, that, than I am complaining about the atmosphere. So, 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 so a related thing to think about uh, when you think about immunity is well, what would happen without the immunity? And this goes again to the point of if there is no no other exposure, either because there's no claim or there's First Amendment protection or whatever. What do we think would happen to to Twitter or YouTube or take your pick if? The words um, uh, other, otherwise objectionable. objectionable. <laughs> I should memorize it. <laughs> if the words otherwise objectionable were deleted and instead specific illicit categories were put in there, what do we think would happen? Well, I can answer that. Uh, by the way, I, I think we chose otherwise objectionable so that it would be alliterative and thus a Mnemonic, so you can remember it more. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but what would happen is that there would be lawsuits, uh, and we would simply be passing the decision over to the courts. The courts, by the way, being an arm of government. Uh, so you've got a different style of government regulation that is peculiarly slow. Uh, you know, the average time for a case that makes it past. Uh, judgment on the pleadings and, and motions to dismiss uh, in the federal system uh, in civil cases is seven years. Uh, so uh, 
if I'm getting sued once in a while, uh, that's life. Uh, but if I'm a newspaper, I can deal with that for the simple reason that it's, you know, we're the many, or pardon me, we're the one and, and they're the many, uh, so we have you know, you know, fewer things that we have to defend. Uh, but now, all of a sudden, if I have to defend hundreds of thousands or more likely millions or more likely hundreds of millions or for the largest platforms, billions of pieces of content and they're all coming up in real time and everybody gets to sue and everything is a potential complaint and any time I moderate it, uh, somebody can complain, why then I'm gonna have uh, what uh, Judge Kaczynski you know, famously referred to as death by a thousand duck, duck bites. And, and duck bites sound, I think, too mild for seven years worth of litigation in every case. This can be very expensive. How am I going to deal with this as a platform? Pretty easily, I'm going to say, you know what? You know how much we charge uh, people to put their posts up on our site? Nothing. Uh, so it's not a revenue source all by itself. Um, User-created content is a menace. Uh, let's have a lot less of it. And that's what will happen. Uh, because platforms are nothing if not liability averse. What do we do about misinformation and disinformation? Wait, I'm well, sorry if you want to go back to yes. I just before Here's we go to that, um, right. I, I'm skeptical that there actually would be uh, billions of, lo of lawsuits or, or hundreds of millions, because if there were, that means the problem of content moderation and the dissatisfaction of the users is far more massive than I think it is. I think it's very serious. The concerns about viewpoint discrimination and on the flip side of offensive speech and, and disinformation, but. I don't think that there are every day billions of incidents that will produce complaints and lawsuits. And I think if there were, the courts would take care of that in a hurry because it would clog their dockets. Well, well, think about the prodigy situation. Uh, we have the Wolf of Wall Street. You all remember Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio. Uh, this is a real life firm, uh, Stratton Oakmont, that's the plaintiff against Prodigy, and uh, while I have had difficulty, uh, and I, I infer that Jeff Kosef has too, because in his book he had been able to write specifically how much the settlement was for, I know how much was demanded, and it was hundreds of millions of dollars, and that was one case. So how many of these cases does it take uh, before somebody says, we're not going to bear this liability, a single piece of content can cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. And this was back in the 1990s. We've had some inflation since then. Uh, so uh, how, how many of those does it take before I say, we have to be much more strict about what we allow up in the way of user creative content, just as a business decision. So, so, so this is though the, why the C1, C2 issue matters, because the Oakmont Stratton is a C1 issue. and. At least I'm not suggesting that we undo that immunity. I haven't heard anybody advocate that. Um, so the question is, is, is if you narrowed the immunity for content moderation to the obscene, lewd, lascivious, uh, violent, harassing, um, how, what's the consequence then if the you don't have other ones? F3 of the statute, which is the part that's not the 26 words, says that I myself am a, oops, Daisy, careful with this mic. Uh, I myself am a content creator uh, mm -hmm. if I become involved in the subsequent development of that content. And so uh, I, I, do, I don't have full protection from C1. I, I need the Good Samaritan exception in order to protect me for content moderation. And, and again, under my hypothetical, you have it for taking down obscene, lewd, lascivious, and, and the other uh, categories in the statute. What you don't have is unbridled ability to say, I can take down anything I want and well, have immunity. I, I think you and I can agree on that. Uh, and I, I would just contend that that's not what the statute said. And I don't think the courts have gone off the rails in interpreting it that way. And I would say particularly after um, uh, Backpage got straightened out. Backpage was, you know, in the First Circuit for some time, in my view, wrongly decided. Mm -hmm. And we haven't got time, but there are some other cases that I think were wrongly decided under the statute in the early days of Section 230. But I think, you know, since uh, Backpage got straightened out and the First Circuit got that right, 
since roommates.com in the Ninth Circuit, I don't think there have been uh, bad decisions in the Ninth Circuit area that have failed to notice that platforms themselves can be content creators. The roommates case was particularly interesting uh, since it was decided uh, in 2008, and you know here we are, you know, a decade and a half later, uh, and we're talking about algorithms. I think the answer to that question is buried in not even buried beneath the surface. It's right on the surface in in roommates. Yeah. So that's an. I mean, and it goes to the question Shane is about to ask um, <laughs> about um, about uh, disinformation. Um, Go ahead and complete my thought for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I, you know, so I, I, I think the, uh, you know, the really interesting question is, is there any 230 reform that would be valuable or could be useful or is it already in the statute under roommates.com um, that could be used to address the disinformation problem. And I want to say, I think the, the uh, proposal uh, in Congress on this is a total mess. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't want to hold that out as a model. That said, I do think we have to think about the question, you know, if I post something that is defamatory, that is false that is going to cause people to not get, you know, to make terrible medical decisions that is going to, you know, go down your list of disinformation categories. Um, and because it acquires a certain organic uh, enthusiasm among my followers, the platform decides, hey, this is high engagement content. Let's show it to a billion other people. The question of how we regard that algorithmic decision strikes me as a really important one that contemporary 230, even with roommates, does not really answer. Roommates answers the question, if there's a drop-down menu for roommates with invidious categories, so I want a room only with you know, white people, which was literally an option on, on that. That's an editorial decision on the part of the, the, the uh, platform that is not immunized. But what if they've added nothing to it? They've just made sure that a million people saw it and no human being ever made that decision. I think that's a really interesting challenge of how we regard, and it's where the action is in the disinformation space, because the platforms really aren't actually creating disinformation ever. They're, uh, they're making decisions often without human involvement about how many people see RT's disinformation or, uh, you know, lots of domestically produced stuff as well. Yeah, I think a couple of uh, half-formed unrelated thoughts, right? One would be um, there, there's a difference between direct liability and, and, and intermediary liability, which is kind of what you're getting at. There's always, to the extent that there's a claim, there's still a claim for the, the creator of that disinformation, and 230 doesn't stop that, right? right. It's just a question of uh, once it's algorithmically amplified, right? Is that a first known editorial control issue, right? Is the design of the algorithm something that is an editorial judgment? Um, but uh, no, no. But just, but just to be clear, if I if if, if I wrote a, a, a defamatory pamphlet about mm -hmm. you, uh, you would have an action against me. But if I gave it to uh, AEI and AEI printed a million copies of it and distributed it on the street, you'd also have an action against AEI. Right. And so the, 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 question, the question is, do, where does 230 situate, if, if we change the name of AEI to Facebook or YouTube, <laughs> um, what, what is, how does it think about that decision? Oh, this is an interesting piece of, of uh, uh, content about Professor Lyons, let's, let's make sure a lot of people see it. Yeah, so the, the, the piece I want to draw out was sort of um, 
are we looking at this piece of information and amplifying it because of its content, right? Or are we looking at this as something that's getting a lot of engagement and therefore amplifying it because it's likely to get more engagement without making a judgment as to the, the content itself? Those strike me as two different things. Um, and like I said, sort of half form thoughts, right? I kind of think of the intermediary liability issue as the equivalent of like premises liability, where we, we hold landlords liable for open manhole covers, right? But we don't hold them liable for is a coffee shop liable for two guys sitting in the back corner discussing a, a bank robbery. So, uh, what does algorithmic uh, amplification look like? Is it more like creating the manhole, the open manhole cover situation, or is it more like there are some people using our our shop in a way that lots of other people are using our shop for, and we're not listening to all these conversations? Yeah, I think I think those are exactly the questions that the current congressional thinking on this is not ask or not asking. But I think I, I think this is if if you want to talk about how 230 interacts with the disinformation space, this is this question is really where the action is. Well since nobody's jumping in on this, just uh, to invite all of our panelists to be legislators for a moment and think about this from the standpoint of of uh, writing improvements to Section 230. If you were going to do that, um, I can fill you in on what the thinking was originally back in the 90s. And if you agree with the template, you can just sort of extend the logical thought process. When I mentioned, by the way, that I thought roommates was relevant to this question uh, that you had raised about, uh, and that's now been thoroughly discussed, about algorithmic amplification. Uh, it's because I view roommates as, as saying not only that a drop-down menu is a problem, but that a drop-down menu, which was hard-coded into the platform, in other words, it was computer code, uh, was no different than if a human being had made that choice. Uh, that, that's essentially the holding in that case. And that gives you, you know, a way to think about it. So I just invite you to think about the problem that way, and that leads to some rather rapid conclusions about uh, how you answer these questions. Uh, it, get, it clears away some of the fog because if, if it's all, you know, machine, I, I, you know, go forward 30 years and think of the trouble that that type of analysis will get us in. Uh, 30 years from now, imagine how powerful artificial intelligence will be, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it'll be smarter than people. And, and if we're able to say as defense lawyers uh, that, well, hey, we didn't do it. Uh, the AI did it. Nobody would be liable for anything. Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, we're best off to follow uh, the line of thinking that originally we had when we created Section 230, which is, is it reasonable to hold somebody responsible for knowing what is happening with this particular piece of content. And because of the problem of the many on the one, the you know, millions and now billions of users, uh, the, the thought was it's unreasonable for a real-time communication technology to expect the platform to actually know and understand all this stuff. But in, in the case where somebody does know and understand it, and if they're actually uh, editing it, uh, if they are you know, reading it and understanding it and making changes to it the way you did as a newspaper editor, well, then it's not unreasonable to expect they should be responsible for it. So thinking about the problem in that way, and that's the approach we took in Section 230 originally, uh, you know, I think uh, you could get much more refined about how you wrote more to the statute to deal with these future problems. Then I would drop a... a caveat at the end and say, uh, I would trust this panel, all of, all of you having listened to you, uh, to be reasonable in what you write into the statute. Unleashing many committees of Congress <laughs> with all the different political flavors that have got their oars in the water about this right now, and hoping that by the time it gets through all those committees, through all the amendments, through all the floor amendments, uh, and then a House-Senate conference, uh, that it's still just what we wanted and didn't break the internet. Uh, that's, a different, that's a different deal. 
So I want to say I want to thank people that put in questions to Chris's point about um, algorithmic. There's five questions here, and you guys predeterminately answered all five of them. So there was no reason to ask. I was like, well, that one's done. That one's done. So uh, we have one minute left. I'm going to start with Jeff and come this way. If you could think about one thing we could be doing in the near future for content moderation or lack thereof, what do you recommend? I guess I'd re repeat what I've said. I think the, the term otherwise objectionable needs, needs to be modified. And as a, as a corollary, part of why to modify it is to open the space to think about whether there are process improvements from a regulatory standpoint that might be desirable. Daniel? I think we should let a thousand flowers bloom. I think that uh, allowing companies to um, design their own content moderation uh, decisions and testing them in the market is a good way to figure out sort of what the optimal choice is, and a choice that may be different from person to person, and it may be different from uh, uh, platform to platform, scenario to scenario. I think that uh, we need to be very careful to distinguish between policy problems that can be addressed through uh, tinkering with Section 230 and policy problems that cannot. And we need to embrace the complexity of those that can and protect the discussion of those that can from the crush of, uh, of those that can't. Chris? So I would be careful about opening the Pandora's box uh, legislatively, uh, but if people are in there uh, making changes, uh, one that I've recommended to Congress is that they make sure that uh, platforms that are presented with a court order that says that content by a user has been adjudged defamatory uh, have to take that down. Uh, there's a California Supreme Court case, state court case, interpreting Section 230 that says otherwise, and I think it's just flat wrong on the face of the statute. But given that that's jurisprudence that's out there, you know, go ahead and fix it. Uh, you know, the other thing that I would say is that uh, uh, I, I applaud the way the courts are going in interpreting uh, Section F3, if we're doing uh, wiring diagrams here. Uh, the, the, that's the part of the statute that says that you are a content creator, even if you're the platform, if you were involved, even if only in part, in uh, creating or subsequently developing that content, I would put that in bold. You know, just bold type it <laughs> right, right in the United States Code. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for a very vibrant discussion this morning. I know it'll be one of many on this conversation. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us.